Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar brought to you by Mix It Up. My name is Michelle Allison, and I'm the publisher of Top Crop Manager. This is the third resistance management webinar we're hosting this spring, and today I'm joined by Ann Verhelen, Soil Management Specialist of Horticulture with OMAFRA. Now, today during our session, Anne will provide you with some information that will set you up for a good experience with cover crops. She'll discuss why to consider cover crops, what the past has taught us, and some tips for future success with them. Special thanks to Mix It Up by Bayer Crop Science for sponsoring our session today. From seed to harvest, Bayer is focused on delivering top performing solutions to address some of your toughest farm challenges. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all attendees and registrants approximately 24 hours after our live broadcast. The session will run for approximately 45 minutes and following Anne's presentation, we'll open the floor to any questions. If you do have questions throughout the webinar, um, please type them into the questions tab found on the GoToWebinar panel on your computer screen. This webinar has been approved for one CCA CEU credit in crop management and further instruction for submissions will follow the presentation if you did not submit your CCA number when you registered for today's webinar. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Anne to um, move forward. Great, thanks Michelle. So we're gonna talk about cover crops today. And I have to admit, I usually like looking at people when I'm talking rather than just looking at my screen and my office wall. So bear with me. Um, and please make sure that you do submit your questions as we go along, because I'd much rather have a discussion than just have me talk. So let's get started. What to consider when looking at cover crops? Okay. Well, if we're thinking about using cover crops, we always have to balance the risk versus the reward. So cover crops are not a easy button type of thing. They do require management and they require a fair bit of thought. So let's talk about what do you want from your cover crop? What's your goal? Are you looking for water and wind erosion protection? Are you needing to scavenge or actually grow some nutrients? Are we looking to build better soil structure or soil health by increasing soil stability, allowing better water infiltration? Are we looking for more biopores? Or are we trying to increase organic matter? And then of course there's trafficability, the word I always have a hard time saying. Are we looking for a cover crop to make any of those infield operations a little bit better, say late fall? Then there's pest management. Are we wanting to use the cover crop to suppress weeds, diseases, insects? And overall biological or ecological health. Are we wanting to increase diversity by supporting beneficial insects, spiders, and even soil-borne organisms like beneficial ne nematodes and things like that? And another critical one is, are we wanting to use that cover crop to provide additional forage or grazing? Well, let's take a look at these piece by piece. There's been work done at the Upper, River, Upper Thames River Conservation Authority uh, looking at what cover crops can really do to reduce soil erosion and impact water quality. And we know that we can really do a good job in reducing soil erosion if we've got overwintering cover crops. So in this case, you can see the picture, we've got some cereal rye and some volunteer wheat. You can see the difference between the two stands and it does make a significant difference. And in this case, they are measuring um, phosphorus and we can see that concentrations were reduced by up to 80% using the cover crop. And of course, this changes depending on what your soil topography is. Gentle slopes, not as big a deal. Steeper slopes, of course, a huge deal. And erosion can take a lot of different forms, whether it's snurt, you can see the uh, soil, covered, soil covered snow in the, the upper left hand corner, or some of the rills and beginning of gully type of erosion that we get from some of the heavy rainstorms. You gotta consider what that topsoil is worth. Uh, back in the winter at the Southwest Ag Conference, Marty Vermey from the Grain Farmers of Ontario did a nice little calculation looking at what topsoil is worth. And so when you start thinking about how much am I losing? Is it worth using a cover crop? He did it based on what a cubic yard of topsoil, if you were to buy it, and then did the math to bring it up to being, you know, $2,500 per acre per inch. 
eh, starts to be worth a little bit because it doesn't take a lot to lose a fair bit of soil. Even sheet erosion, where it's basically taking the, the thickness of a paper sheet every year starts to add up. And what about nitrogen cycling? Well, we've got, uh, or other nutrients, but let's just look at nitrogen cycling. We've got certain cover crops that are nitrogen fixers, things like clover, alfalfa, peas, beans, all the legumes. We've got other ones that are good scavengers. The typical grasses, oats, corn, rye, all the brassicas, whether it's radish, oilseed radish, mustard, turnip, uh, buckwheat, phacelia, which may be a strange one for many people. Uh, even legumes are decent nitrogen scavengers because, you know, they'll be lazy. They'll pick up nitrogen if it's sitting there waiting for them. And that will at least reduce the amount of nitrogen in the soil going over winter. So we have less chance of loss. And over the past few years, there's been lots of work. Here's a study actually from a potato rotation in eastern Washington. Now, does that really apply to us? Mm, maybe, maybe not. But it's interesting that on a low organic matter, sandy soil, with a very much a hort type of rotation, they managed to recover some of this nitrogen. Now they're saying that they're getting a, a cycling of about 29% of the nitrogen in the cover crop being cycled to the next crop. This is a little bit in, um, and it may be because with mustard cover crops, usually you're growing them immediately before establishing the potatoes. Whereas most of our experience here in Ontario with growing cover crops, things like um, red clover and things like that, uh, it's grown the year before and then we see what what we've got back and i'll talk about red clover a little bit more in a second now some of these other cover crops that people are using whether it's cereal rye or brassicas like radish we are not seeing good cycling of nitrogen the research that we've done in ontario says things like oats and radish that die over winter are leaky and we're not getting that transfer to the next crop now that said, we do have cover crops like clovers that do fix nitrogen. So here's some work from Xu Ming at uh, AAFC. So that's Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Harrow. And this is his technician. You can see the lovely, absolutely gorgeous crimson clover back there behind them. This is his organic trial. And you got to keep in mind, this is in Harrow, where he's been looking at crimson clover, hairy vetch, and red clover and what kind of a nitrogen credit he can get out of those cover crops. But again, keep in mind, this is a cover crop that was not terminated in the fall. It was terminated late spring, so we're talking May into June even. Actually, I believe it was May. In Harrow, so the southernmost part of Ontario. So very much warmer than most of the rest of the country. Uh, a lot longer growing season, both in the fall and in the spring. And he is using full tillage, so plowing, to release this nitrogen. But you can see he's getting a significant nitrogen credit from all these cover crops. The other proviso here is crimson clover is not one that we see consistently good overwintering in most of Ontario. So to get that kind of, of um, turnover of nitrogen is, is pretty significant. Our more typical cover crop would be red clover after wheat. So here's some work from Dr. Dave Hooker. He manages the long-term rotation and tillage trial at Ridgetown, where we've got a variety of different um, rotations and also two different tillage, whether it's no-till or um, a full-till type of situation. And they've been looking at corn yields after wheat with and without red clover. So you can see that the dark bars are with red clover, the lighter bars are without red clover. So this is over his whole project. And you have to keep in mind that the fertilizer nitrogen that was applied to these plots is not limiting in any way. So it's not like they're adding or adjusting for the nitrogen that's being given from the red clover, but it's also they're putting on 180 in those first few years and now more recently 240 pounds of actual nitrogen so it's not like nitrogen is, in, is a limiting factor for these crops. You can see the corn yield boost that we get with red clover. And keep in mind also that our standard nitrogen adjustments for red clover in Ontario are 82 to 67 kilos per hectare. So that 82 would be if you had plowed it or worked it, 67 is if it was no till. Now, so we talked about um, 
erosion, we talked about nutrients. Now let's take a look at building better, healthier soils. So with cover crops, we're using living roots to build organic matter. And we've, stepping back a little bit, we've, we've got a different understanding, a more recent understanding of organic matter, that it is much more driven by the soil microbes, by the soil life. And so with our new understanding, it's about 50% or more is actually being laid down through the, the life and, and actually death of the microbes. So that comes back to, <coughs> excuse me, um, necromath, so the dead microbes. And if you figure 20 to 50% of the carbon fixed under photosynthesis by plants is released to the soil through rhizodeposition. So that means it's released by the roots and it feeds those microbes. And those root exudates, there's more recent studies that now show they're five times more likely to become part of the soil organic matter. And those root tissues are much more likely to be still in situ and become part of the stable organic matter than the above ground part. This is where cover crops start to play a really big part, especially in cash crop type rotations where we've got corn, soybeans, and wheat. If you look at a standard ca cash crop rotation, there's a lot of those times where we don't have living root systems. Add in some cover crops, we've got a lot more living roots, we've got a lot more exudates, feeding the microbes, and building organic matter and cycling organic matter and in particular cycling carbon. So to build on that a little bit, here's some work from uh, Dr. Laura Van Eerd, also here at Ridgetown. She's got a long-term uh, cover crop study where she's been growing radish and rye, radish, cereal rye by itself, and oats and then has a strip with no cover. And this has been at this point, the, the data I have in front of me right now is about four years now, this is about seven years. And she was already is already starting to see some significant differences that we're seeing by having that radish and rye, but in particular the rye. And I think some of what's going on there is that we've got those living root systems there all the way through the fall and into the spring and you've got that cycling of carbon going on. So we're building organic matter with cover crops. Now, when I start talking about cover crops anymore, it isn't just soil health that we talk about. We also talk about how does this play with weed management? And I love what Mike Cobra did. I, I borrowed these slides from him and I just love what he did. This is one of my personal bugaboos when I, I go home at night after weed harvest and I look at my neighboring fields. Some have cover crops, some have clover, and there's an awful lot that don't have anything and they just grow up in weeds. And I got to give Mike kudos for slowing down and taking the measurements, taking the pictures. So here's two fields, one that was planted into oats, one that was left for mother nature to plant. And it's interesting to note that the field one, so that's planted into oats, this is a few weeks of, of growth. And then looking at this fallow field where it was just left, not mowed, just left to grow up and people were busy doing something else, of course. Well, Mike's a smart guy. He pulls over and he takes and starts looking around. So here's what he came up with in field one where he's got just an oak cover crop. This is not rye. This is not anything that aggressive. This is simple oats. Look at the size of the weeds there. They're pretty tiny. They're not going to amount to much. Whereas the weeds on the other side, there's a lot more weeds and you can see the amount of weed seed production that's going to happen and you can see the size of them too. So even oats can do a lot for suppressing weeds. The other piece that really has promise with cover crops as far as a tool to suppress resistant weeds. Again, this is some photos from Mike Cobra. He's been working with Dr. Francois Tardif at the University of Guelph, looking at the ability of, of cereal rye to suppress Canada fleabane, and it's significant. You can see to the line, this is not two pictures pushed together. This is one picture looking at the line of rye, and to the left, we've got rye, to the right, we've got fleabane. And when you look closer into the rye, the fleabane, there's still a little bit there. The fleabane that's there is quite small, still quite easily suppressed. 
and killed, whereas the flea bane that is in the area without a, a rye cover crop is definitely going to be uh, more advanced and it's going to be starting to set seed. So they took this and went into some further work. Again, this is uh, Francois Tardif and Dr. Clarence Swanton, and then a grad student, Ted Van Hoy. And uh, again, another slide I've borrowed from someone else, Cameron Ogilvie at Soils at Guelph provided this one to me. And they were looking at the impact of Aragon plus rye plus no-till. So just looking at the amount of flea bane control that we get, looking at no rye versus rye, well, we're getting something over 40, almost 50% control just with rye. And then you get the one-two punch when you add the Aragon in there. So again, no rye versus no rye with Aragon or rye with Aragon. It's that tag team approach and we've got uh, two modes of action, of course, the herbicide and the physical um, competition that the rye provides and suppression that it's doing. And we get a, a really nice tool for resistant weed control. Now, what about using cover crops another way? And this is one of the ways that you can really pay for cover crops fairly quickly if you're using it for grazing or for stored feed. And just as an example, uh, here's one of the cooperators that I work with. I do some compaction measurements on his fields. This is Mike Buis from near Chatham, not too far from me. Uh, he's got a mixed farm as far as a fair number of beef cows, about 300. Um, there's vegetables and field crops that rotate through his fields. He uses a lot of rye, oats, winter barley has become one of his more favorite ones lately. He works a lot with his neighbors to get uh, cover crops in and he's pretty committed to the whole cover cropping thing. So he's got cattle grazing cover crops from fall to spring. He usually is calving out on, on these areas. It's managed to drive his feed costs down. And interesting, some of his first observations were a huge increase in herd health and better mothering. He sees, and I've seen, I've measured it on his farm, improved soil quality. And they have seen yield increases when the tomatoes are planted back there. And he, is able to put some actual dollars to that as far as he figures he's getting back about sixty dollars per acre and uh but mike's a realist uh he's very very much a realist so at the end of the day cover crops have to make sense within the whole farm system from the cost of the seed to the timely fall planting and spring management if it doesn't make sense it won't work for example mike's changed up how some of his seeding is done because he was finding it was very rushed this past year he actually got his rice flowing on into his corn and he's out grazing it now. Uh, I'm hoping to get out there in the next few days and start taking some measurements and we'll be following up with some compaction measurements in his fields uh, later this spring. Keep, he keeps on changing up his system a little bit and a little bit, it's great. Uh, another slide from Cameron uh, that talked about a different aspect. So Mike grazes, but there's also uh, been a lot of work done about forages. So harvested feed and oats in fall, and I've always maintained this myself, but Bill Dean's done some work looking at oats, barley, oat pea forages, and the quality that we get in the late summer and fall with a fall grown cereal is totally different. And I have to admit, I've observed that at myself at home. It, uh, it's like candy as far as the use are concerned. So I got asked to also share what we've learned about cover crops. So we've been doing projects with cover crops, well, for more than 10 years. In fact, I've probably been working with cover crop plots off and on for the last 25 years plus. We've learned a lot over the, that time. It still comes back to some basics though you have to think about what's my goal. Once you know your goal, it's a little bit easier to choose. So are you looking for nitrogen production? Are you looking for scavenging? Are we looking for weed suppression? Are we looking for nematode suppression in the case of a lot of horticultural crops? Are we looking to build soil structure? Do you want to bust up some compacted areas? That's a very much a, a very specialized area. Are we looking for just biomass, like lots of root mass, lots of top growth? Then we're looking at things like oats and radish, and in the summer we might be looking at some of the warm season grasses like millets and sorghum, sorghum Sudan. For basic erosion protection, we're often looking at the winter cereals, winter rye, triticale, uh, possibly ryegrass, winter barley, spring barley, oats, those kinds of things. The other thing that I usually talk about 
at the same time as we're talking about what's your goals and what cover crops are you thinking about, as you're picking the cover crop, you got to think about control. There's nothing worse, nothing more frustrating than having a beautiful cover crop and looking at it and going, oh crap, how am I going to get rid of that? Or if you get a wide open fall and you've got a lot of growth, how am I going to, de how am I going to deal with it? And it's very much where you are in your soil type and what kind of equipment you've got, but you've got to consider what are your options for control. Is it going to winter kill? Will it freeze out? So things like oats, things like radish most years, um, all those kind of things will freeze out. Will tillage take it out? Timing of tillage also becomes critical. Is herbicide an option? And some of the more newer options are things like roller crimpers or mowing, and there's all combinations beyond that that you can look at. So getting started, a great place to start, an easy place to start is after winter wheat, spring cereals, or other early harvested crops. So in my area, things like processing peas, snap beans, sweet corn, um, uh, any of those kinds of crops where we've got a good length of time, late summer and into the early fall to get some good growth. But you gotta think about the timing. How does it fit in the growing season? Do we have enough time to make it worthwhile? that we're gonna get enough growth to make that seed investment worthwhile. That depends a bit too, depending on what your goal was. If your goal was to build organic matter, remember what I said about the roots. So a little bit of growth on top doesn't necessarily mean that you haven't achieved everything if that's what you're after, if you're after roots. The other thing we need to think about is what's your next crop? What's your weed control gonna be? And what is the goal? Because that will change what your seeding rate is. The other thing is you have to consider the rules of agronomy don't change just because it's a cover crop. Cover crops are not the panacea for everything. Uh, they are a crop and they need to be managed. So you have to consider the competition from volunteer wheat. So if you're planting it after a winter wheat crop and you didn't have a red clover uh, frost seeded on there already, you're going to have competition from volunteer wheat and it usually will pay you to suppress that in some way to allow the cover crop to establish itself and then you have to look at seeding rates and depth and so the seeding rate is going to vary depending on how are you planting it are you planting it with a drill then you can reduce your seeding rate usually if you're going to broadcast it on you need to bump it a little bit if you're going to plant it with a drill I know this is going to seem obvious, uh, but I've got caught on it. I know other people have too. Often the last thing we've used that drill for was probably some late planted soybeans, in which case the depth might be a little off for your cover crop. We need to adjust depth to reflect what we're planting. So if we're planting, see that mix on the right hand side? That's a radish and oat mix with a bit of volunteer weed in there. Um, that kind of a mix we can plant an inch or even it'll probably still come up even two inches down. But if we start getting into some of the finer seeds, we really have to watch our depth because crimson clover, any of the clovers don't like to come up from a, a great depth. And you have to kind of pair that off against the larger seeds like peas that need enough depth to actually have enough moisture to really get going. And I often hear, well, I'll just use my volunteer winter wheat. It makes a good cover crop, right? Uh, well, this is where we've done a little bit of work. Adam Hayes and I had a three-year project with the Soil and Crop Tier 2 project looking at various cover crops and always we had a check where it was just uh, pretty much an undisturbed area after the, the, uh, the uh, harvest had been done and we'd had a little bit of tillage. So here's some comparisons where we were at Ridgetown. These are all in October, so we've had lots of time for the cover crop to grow. We've got strips across the whole field. Here's our check strips where it's just the volunteer wheat. And you can see the huge difference that we have. So the problem is if we're looking for a cover crop that's gonna provide some erosion protection, gonna do some weed suppression, going to do some organic matter um, amendment, volunteer wheat, just the stand's not consistent enough. And if you have a combine that's not blowing out enough out the back, you are going to have a lot of weeds. So that's a problem. So I generally don't recommend that volunteer winter wheat is going to make your cover crop. Now, if you went in and overseeded with some winter wheat, 
different story. There's been a lot of interest in mixes in recent years. We've done a fair bit of work looking at different mixes and I often get the question, so what's the best mix? Well, mixes can build some diversity and depending on what you've got in there, it, it, there is some response to soil nitrogen. Uh, you also need to think about your mix in terms of, am I putting manure on or am, am I not? If I have no manure, probably some legumes would help. If I do have manure, I'd skip the legumes. It's just gonna increase the cost. When you're creating a mix, unless you're using one right off the shelf, you probably want to look at what the species are. So you need to reduce the rates of any of the dominating species. So radish has a tendency to dominate. And we usually talk about not putting more than, say, two pounds per acre of radish. And if you're talking the really tiny seeded brassicas like turnip, you're probably talking a half a pound. There are some species to avoid too. Um, I personally anymore would probably avoid things like annual ryegrass. I wouldn't put buckwheat, and there's there's a mix of opinions about that. I wouldn't put buckwheat in a mixture because it will probably set seed. The other thing to think about with mixes is seeding rates. Uh, some of the best advice I've had from very successful cover crop uh, farmers is less is more. So it's better to have a consistent stand of a mix, but not a heavy stand. Then again, it also depends on what your goal is, because if you're planning on, on uh, grazing that area, you certainly want a lot more uh, plants there because you've got to support the grazing. And as you get later into the fall, you'll probably want to increase your seeding rate because you won't have as much top growth just in order to get the soil protection. So the next slide is really around patience. This is, uh, it often doesn't look like much, so here's a cover crop mixture that was seeded in after wheat harvest. This is in early August. It's probably been in there for, oh, probably three weeks. It went into fairly moist conditions. Doesn't look like it's gonna amount to a whole lot. There doesn't look like there's a lot there, but you just have to wait. And it's interesting to watch as it changes over time. So here's that same field in November. At this point, the, all the legumes have come along. The Anything that is frost sensitive has already frosted off so the sunflowers are dying. Um, it's a beautiful mixture and the ground is well covered. One of the other things we've learned, and this is a little bit complicated looking at this slide, this is one from Chris Brown, some work she's done with cover crop mixtures, various ones, and then with and without manure. Um, I think the key thing to take away from this is that cover crops and manure make a great fit and that we get a huge bump in top growth and if we get a huge bump in top growth we're going to have significantly more root growth and that's what we're aiming for so manure and cover crops fit together very very well now i often get questions about how do i fit it into the rest of the rotation well there's some places in corn where you can fit a cover crop uh, usually it's between v4 and v7 that's a little hard to hit because Often the choices we have then are really related to our herbicide choices. And I think you need to make your herbicide choice first and then see if your cover crop fits. Uh, if you look on field crop uh, news, you'll find a, a whole series of pieces on there. And I'll, I'll show you that website in a minute uh, that talk about the herbicide connection with various cover crops. So hitting that V4 to V7 is really tough. It needs that cover crop needs to be seeded in, so it means modifying a drill. Broadcasting leaves it really open to, to whether we get any rain or not. And then our corn, generally, we just have too much shade and too much competition. I think we get better establishment if we can fly it on, spin it on, or whatever, as the leaves start to dry pre-harvest, or come back in and plant it post-harvest if you're in an area where there's enough time after harvest. There's a big difference about whether we're talking grain corn versus silage versus sweet or versus seed corn. Silage, I think, is an easy place to get a cover crop into. And you can see a couple of uh, examples here from right out um, here at Ridgetown. One is some annual ryegrass that was seeded into grain corn. That would have been that V4, V7. We tend to get really spotty stands. It really is very much weather dependent and how you seed it and a little bit of luck, I swear. Whereas rye drilled after silage harvest usually looks beautiful. 
and then you've got a good protection on that field some real soil armor for the the winter so that's wheat after wheat after corn now what about with soybeans if you're doing soybeans they're pretty competitive through the year so you're not going to be seeding in in advance the only place where it really fits is about leaf yellows when leaf leaves are starting just about to drop uh, it's still going to be somewhat iffy and the other challenge is what do you put in there that if you get into a wet harvest you don't end up with something that's going to be growing up and becoming a problem with the combine so avoid things like oats some people have had good uh, luck with oats but I'm more likely to go with a cereal rye or something like that I think you have a lot more success after harvest that's when we plant winter wheat and I guess uh, I'd say let's go to winter wheat if we can but if you've got acres that aren't going to winter wheat, then certainly after soybeans, there's not enough residue there for good soil protection over winter. And as our winters seem to be being more open with a lot more rain and a lot more melt, I think it pays to have a, a cover crop there. And a light dusting of rye after harvest will certainly help keep that field in place. On the flip side though, soybeans are a great option if you've got lots of, of cover crop residue. and there's been a fair bit of work. Uh, one of my colleagues, Jake Monroe, has got a project with Soil and Crop looking at roller crimping and planting uh, organic no-till soybeans and with a great deal of success. That cereal rye does a great job at suppressing weeds, uh, holding moisture, and soybeans seem to be well adapted to establish in, in that kind of cover. That said, though, the other things we've learned the rules of agronomy haven't changed. So the previous slide show you, you how the soybeans can be very successful. It still takes management. So wet soil, dry soil, light soil, heavy soil, you have to adapt your management just like you would with any other crop. And the key in planting into cover crops is that soil to seed contact, and that has not changed. Another thing that hasn't changed, you got to consider some of those cover crops can become weeds. And in this case, this is a field that had a large multi-mix and it had buckwheat that uh, buckwheat and sunflowers actually that uh, volunt that set seed and volunteered the next year. The challenge with those is it, depending on your herbicide program, these are the kind of cover crop seeds that then volunteer and emerge over a, an extended period of time. So if you're trying to just do burn-offs, it's not going to do a good job. So consider things like buckwheat. And again, lots of people are not concerned about handling buckwheat. It's fairly easy to kill. Annual ryegrass is a lot more of a concern as um, there's a greater possibility of having resistance there. Radish has a tendency, especially if you have the oil, old oil seed radish or even the, the newer one, there is some hard seed, so you will have some volunteers. There's a number of different cover crops that if they're not managed well, they can become ongoing weed problems. Another thing where the ag agronomics don't change is rotation is still important. Uh, we, we often see some issues if we're planting uh, corn into rye. There's people who make it work, but there's other people that have horrible results with uh, trying to get the corn established in, into cereal rye if we haven't got the cereal rye killed appropriately. There's other aspects if we're using um, things like radish or bra other brassicas like turnip in a mix or by themselves if you're coming back and you've got canola or something like that in your rotation. Uh, another thing to consider is if, if you are trying to use annual ryegrass as an interseed into corn, probably not a good option if you've got wheat in that rotation because that limits the years that you've got a chance to control that annual ryegrass if we've got some problems. And one of the other places where we've been seeing some issues and some challenges with, with some of these cover crops is just as we change the soils and we change the amount of residue on the surface, some growers are experiencing some more challenges with slugs. And as you can see, Tracy talks about slugs thrive in a wet spring. And the cover crop Farmers who've been successful tell me the best way to manage it, move your crop residues away from the seed row as much as possible, ensure the seed slots are closed, 
and you can see this one has opened up. And the reason why you want the seed slot closed is because otherwise it basically come, becomes a slug highway. They don't have to get out on the surface and be exposed to the sun. They can truck their way down that seed slot where it's cool and moist and, and uh, go corn plant to corn plant. There are some cover crop growers who are trying to have another cover crop still growing there to provide more attractive feed and basically be a trap crop and pull the slugs away from uh, particularly the corn and the soybeans that we're trying to grow. But uh, that one's still a challenge for us. Another caution I'd like to make is make sure when you're looking for information that you're evaluating that information based on your own growing conditions. I had the chance to go a few years ago um, on a way out to Saskatoon, had a chance to stop in and visit with Abby Wick at a North Dakota field day. Um, you never realize how differently things grow until you go somewhere else. Abby's not a short lady. Uh, she's a lot taller than me. She's at least six feet. So you can see that this isn't exactly Ontario corn. That was that year. That That's a couple of years ago. Uh, they seem to have a lot more success interseeding cereal rye because that's a question I often get is why can't I just use cereal rye in that V4, V7 stage in corn? They use it in North Dakota. Well, that's great. Uh, they have a lot more light getting to the ground than we do. If we try, generally, if we're trying to grow cereal rye that's established in that V4 to V7, the cereal rye is going to die, or a lot of it's going to die, unless we've got big gaping holes in that cornfield. Our corn just has too much height and has too much interception of, of the daylight that we just don't get good establishment and long life of that cereal rye. We're much better to use cereal rye at harvest or just prior to harvest with corn. The other thing is there's a number of incentive programs out there. So don't forget to look into those options. That can take some of the edge off of starting into cover crops. We've had them supported under a wide variety of programs. For example, uh, most people can access, if there's a conservation authority near you, a lot of them do have uh, incentives. There's also incentives in, in different localities if you check with your local soil and crop. Interesting to note, this is uh, from Ann Loeffler from the Grand River Conservation Authority. They did a survey and only 55% of them were motivi motivated by the incentive payment of the people who were doing cover crops. So a lot of people see the, the value in cover crops for themselves. The reason I say don't forget to look into the incentive programs is just it can take the edge off a little bit as you learn more about cover crops. So some tips for successful cover cropping. Well, you're starting off right if you're, you're taking part in webinars and things like that, because the first one is do your research, educate yourself. You know your own farm, you know your own cropping system, you know your patience level, you know how things work for you. So go to field days, go to conferences, hit the internet, do YouTube, Twitter, uh, take a look at the Midwest Cover Crop Council and read. There's a ton of stuff out there. There's a lot of supporting information. But read critically and look at the YouTube critically too. And I think the really key thing is go to the stuff that's in your own area. Talk to people who've been ex who have been successful. The ones with experience. The ones who are open about their problems and how they've solved them. Because it does take more management. And if you're looking for some more information, here's some good information that's applicable to Ontario. We've got a fair bit on the OMAFRA website. Uh, there's that field crop news. There's a whole section there on cover crops. And I see Jake has recently posted his uh, report on organic no-till soybean production and whether it's possible in Ontario or not. There's the Midwest Cover Crop Council. We've got a decision tool there that is backed up with freeze uh, frost data for Ontario county by county so you can take a look at what cover crops might look what might work for you and we're in the process of updating that right now another place to take a look is the soil and crop crop advances reports because there's been a, a multitude of cover crop projects whether it's with manure it's with no-till it's with different mixes and they're all reported in those crop advances reports and those are 
done across the province in various various uh, locations. So the other thing, know your goals. That way you can adjust your species and your seeding rates. As I keep getting reminded by one of my colleagues, Christine O'Reilly, our, our forage and grazing specialist, cover crop rates are not forage rates. They're not grazing rates. So keep in mind what you're doing as far as seeding rates, something that's gonna manage that erosion, that rill that we're seeing in the center is not the same seeding rate that we need in order to be able to bail it off. And details matter. Here's one of my buddies from North Dakota, Lee Breeze. He says, once you know your details, you've got the opportunity to find ways new things can fit in. Details matter. I often have guys who've got some confusion around annual ryegrass and cereal rye. They'll just tell me they're working with rye. Well, there's a big difference between annual ryegrass and cereal rye, not just in how it grows. Annual ryegrass is really slow to get growing. It's wispy to start. Cereal rye generally rock and rolls right from the start. It's, it goes and it goes. Annual ryegrass will go to seed. If you plant it in the spring, it's going to try and go to seed. Cereal rye, generally needs some fertilization. And so it's gonna just grow thicker and thicker and get sick with various leaf diseases, but it's gonna be a nice cover there for say driving on a headland. Killing them, totally different. Annual ryegrass can be a real beggar to kill. Seal rye, pretty simple to kill with some glyphosate. So details matter. Some other things, start small, but you gotta treat it like a crop. You gotta be serious about it. If you really wanna be serious, put it someplace where everybody else can see. Start simple, start with the winter killed species like oats and radish or really simple mixtures like oats and radish. Keep it affordable. Most of the guys that I work with will tell me that, you know, 20 bucks an acre is as much as they wanna spend on cover crops. And that's seed, so you gotta figure there's still some more cost. Pay attention to the agronomics. Target, it, target those early harvested crops because that's an easy place to fit. Make sure you've got a plan for termination. And the key part, have a plan B. And the other thing is plant, learn, revise, and plant again. You're going to do your research. You're going to be smart about it. You're going to know what you want to grow. You're still going to learn because you've got to adapt that cover crop to your situation. So plant, learn, revise and plant. And that's it. Any questions? Perfect. Thank you very much, Anne, for a great presentation. We've got quite a few questions coming in, so um, we'll dive right into that. Um, to start off, can you give us a, a you know brief explanation of the best cover crop to break up compaction, if that was our main goal? Okay, so if we went back to that uh, chart, and I'm not even going to try and make my mouse do that, uh, generally for compaction, we're looking at things that are deep-rooted and are going to grow over time. So the deep-rooted things like sweet clover, like alfalfa. Uh, radish also gets uh, tagged as a compaction buster, and it will to a point. But if the soil is dry and hard, or if the compaction is severe, radish is just not going to do it. And you got to be realistic, right? Radish is only growing for a couple of months, whereas sweet clover and alfalfa, we know that those are long-term lignified roots that have a whole couple of years to grow and make their way through every time there's a little bit of a, a fracture or a crack. The other things that will help with compaction uh, are some of the grasses. So sorghum Sudan and some of those warm season grasses have been proven in some areas to do a nice job of breaking up cover compaction, especially if they're mowed and that forces them to, to uh, have a bit of a, a root uh, boost again. Perfect, okay. And so when we're discussing radishes, um, on another note, we've had a drainage contractor note that you shouldn't plant radishes because they will potentially plug the tile. Is that true? Well, we, we've had some of those problems in Ontario where, where uh, and not just in Ontario, they've had them in Quebec where there's been problems with tile drain and radishes. It's usually associated with a couple of things. Uh, it's usually associated with uh, tiles that may not be as high functioning as they could be, shall we say. 
uh, they may have some rough edges on their connections and often there's a fair bit of manure and sometimes it's been early planted and sometimes and quite often it's been a solid planting of radish so fairly high seeding rate then a lot of nitrogen and then it's like you've got bionic radishes so they are they've been selected especially the newer daikon style radish to have a very deep root system and they really do so some ways to manage that is back off on your seeding date uh, so you're into the middle of August and the later part of August, especially if you've got a lot of manure on there. Um, the, if you do have a problem, then maybe change how your connections are. That said, there have been a few other things that have shown up to a plug drainage tile. So cereal rye, cereal rye a few years ago was a few years ago was a terrible problem in Indiana. They actually came to Ontario looking for how we deal with stuff. Uh, there's even been wheat that have plug tiles, so there's a few things and it really depends on if you've got enough flow through that tile, it should flush all those root hairs out. So no reason not to use radish, but maybe use it in a mixture with say oats and a little bit of radish, that kind of thing. Okay, good to know, thank you. Um... Some question on potatoes here. Um, so if you're planning a uh, cover crop to be planted August, September, the year before potatoes, uh, that won't regrow in the spring, what would you suggest? Okay, so something that won't regrow in the spring, but you're gonna have an early enough time to plant it in August or September. It'd be really nice to know if that question came from Ontario. <laughs> uh, I think it came. I think it came from yeah out east there, and he's looking for yeah something that would be uh, easier to till in the spring. Okay, so odds are something like oats or barley would be a good choice. Um, depends on some of your other things, especially if it's out east. You might be looking for some wireworm control too, in which case maybe you should be looking at a mustard cover crop. If you get it planted early enough in in August you'll have enough growth, you could work it down and then still come back maybe with a, a little bit of oats or winter barley. Um, I, I guess if you're really looking to not have to worry about killing something in the spring, uh, oats and barley are, are often your best option there. They're gonna die off over winter and it'll look like a lot of mass on it, but it really isn't that bad once you get to springtime. The other thing is look at your seeding rate you don't need to go nuts and have a heavy, heavy seeding rate. Uh, it could be a fairly light seeding rate so that you've got good, decent, even cover across the field, but you're not trying to graze it or take it for forage. So by the springtime, once it's died down over winter, it'll desiccate and be very little to wor worry about for getting the field ready for potatoes. Perfect, thank you. Um, how much nitrogen can I credit from the cover crop for my next corn crop? Well, that's really going to depend on which cover crop we're working with. So um, my favorite cover crop still is things like red clover because we can frost seed it into spring grains or to winter wheat and we know we can get a decent nitrogen credit. So we know that we're getting 70, 80 units of nitrogen. Some of the other cover crops uh, say radish. I can show you radish numbers where we measured the amount of nitrogen that was taken up by the radish plant and it was significant, like we're talking a couple hundred pounds per acre in the fall, but because it dies over winter, it's leaky and we'll lose most of that. And we just don't see that transfer. We've, If you go back in the soil and crop, um, crop advances reports, you'll see a, a couple of reports there where it was very, a number of different cover crop strip trials were done with and without manure and then taken to corn the next year and we really couldn't see the transfer of nitrogen from radish into the next corn crop. Really it's just the legumes and in particular the only one we have real confidence in is red clover. Okay perfect thanks. Um, I have another question from a grower here are there any specific diseases in cover crops that we need to be concerned about that would affect our main crops? <sighs> I should have Albert here with me for that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, there there are some 
some diseases that you probably want to make some slightly different choices depending on what your following crop is uh, and that is so specific it's hard to to get into a whole lot of detail if you take a look at uh, the cover crop field guide the midwest one that the midwest cover crop council has put together it has uh, some of the diseases and uh, especially also the nematode ratings for various cover crops and if that particular grower wants to email me we can have a further discussion there's a couple other things so say sometimes because it's a cover crop we're not going to see the same disease pressure for example uh, in a lot of mixes guys will put a couple of pounds of sunflower um, often they'll tell me it's because it's got a deep root system it's got nice stalks that last till springtime and they just really like to mess with the neighbors because they've got these lovely big flowers sometimes in October well we know that we associate growing sunflowers with having white mold and so you would never try and grow a field of sunflowers and then follow it with soybeans but that's a field of sunflowers taken to seed sunflowers grown in a cover crop so far we don't see that white mold transfer and in talking it over with our provincial pathologist for field crops Albert Tenuta he tells me the timing for that disease is off when we're growing things like sunflowers in a mix late in the season the the timing for the white mold um, life cycle just doesn't fit so we don't see the disease being worse the next year Perfect, thank you. A um, couple other questions here. Can you um, touch on the, the benefits of, you know, implementing the cover crops um, when on sandy soils? Oh, sandy soils. Sandy soils mm -hmm. are perfect for cover crops. Uh, typically, at least the sandy soils that I've worked on and that I see regularly, we struggle to keep organic matter levels up. Right. Uh, so having the cover crops there means that we're going to be cycling carbon. We might not see big boosts in the actual organic matter numbers, but we are cycling more carbon in there. The other thing with sandy soils is we tend to have moisture deficit. So having cover crops, whether it's that carbon cycling or just the actual physical residue, tends to, to uh, keep that soil uh, moisture there in the middle of the season. I can remember uh, riding in a combine with one of my cooperators and watching the yield monitor as we went over a, a knoll. This was in a series of cover crop strips and we were going down them and as you came up over this knoll and the cover crop residue was there, suddenly his yield would just take this little blip compared to the no cover crop um, check spot that we had beside it. It was it was, uh, was eye-opening for everybody concerned. It was quite fun to watch. So there's a lot of places where cover crops really fit well in sandy soil. So if we're increasing that carbon, it's also going to have a piece to do with uh, ho hopefully supporting a better nutrient cycling and, and retention of nutrients in those sandy soils. Okay, perfect. Thank you for expanding on that. I've got one last question that we'll probably have time for today um about the day of no return when is it too late in the season to seed a cover crop oh man that's so specific <laughs> to where you are and what your soil type and what you're growing next so okay. down here in the banana belt of ontario uh, i often see growers that are still putting cereal rye in well into november even the occasional guy who does it in in december recognizing we're not going to have a lot of cover crop there over winter but it will show up as a green haze and grow like gangbusters come come springtime so when it's too late i usually like to to make sure that i've got at least six weeks that we're going to have some growth it's so it's very dependent on where you are and what you've chosen as a cover crop when it's too late perfect okay thank you and um, before we end today, I just want to remind everybody that has, it has been approved for one credit in crop management and further instructions will be found in our follow up email if you did not submit your CCA number registration. And this email will also hold a recording of the webinar um, in case you missed the first little bit as well. Uh, thank you again, Anne, um, for your, your great presentation and we had lots of engagement, great questions coming from the audience. So thank you to all of our attendees for tuning in today as well. 
Um, don't forget to visit topcropmanager.com slash webinars to view all of our previously recorded webinars, as well as this one will be online uh, within the next day or so. And please connect with us on Twitter by following at topcropmag. Uh, one last special thank you to Mix It Up by Bayer Crop Science for sponsoring the resistance management webinar series this spring. Um, from seed to harvest, Bayer is focused on delivering top performing solutions to address some of your toughest farm challenges. So with that, um, from the entire team, uh, we're wishing you, your teams and your families all the best during this time and a safe growing season if we don't chat before then. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. Take care.